today? I'm very good, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for inviting me into your offices today as well. Yeah, welcome to Dubai actually. We're in the middle of the DIFC area. Yeah. So the Emirates Financial Tower is, is at the beginning, like at, literally at the entrance of the DIFC. It's the greatest financial district. And uh, like actually Dubai is being the, the financial hub nowadays. It, it used to be London. It's still London, but yeah. now Dubai is yeah, actually becoming yeah. more prominent. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So thank you for coming and visiting our office. Uh, I would like to discuss with you something related to the capital markets today. Know more about what you're doing, how your daily routines actually in the market. So okay. let's start uh, with the daily routines. Whenever you look at the chart, you open the gold chart, for example. Um, and you're looking for, for an opportunity to trade in gold or euro or any other currency, any other product. Do you take into consideration only the technicals or you look into the news, the fundamentals, what's happening in the market at the moment? It's, it's, a, it's a broad brush approach. So I'm looking at starting with the technicals when you, you say looking at a chart. I do a top-down analysis. So I go out to the high time frames first of all. So I'm really looking out to the monthly and even the quarterly charts. Even if I'm going to be executing off of a daily chart or a four-hour chart time frame, I'm still going to be, as far as my analysis is concerned, it's going right away out to the bigger time frames. So and within that, that's how I form my view on by any given market. So it's a top-down approach, whereas a lot of traders almost use a, a bottom-up approach. Okay. I came from a fund management uh, industry anyway, 20 odd years ago. So top-down approach was always how I preferred to look at uh, the markets anyway, or look at funds. It's exactly the same with trading. So I start off by doing a multiple time frame analysis, and then I'll have a look at sentiment analysis as well within my trading. I think that's pretty important. Not just what retail traders are, are doing, but also what uh, the commitment of traders reports are like. Um, so you get a, a feel for what the, the, the large speculators are doing, but also just general sentiment as well. It could yeah. be, um, you know, headlines in, yeah, in the magazines, Economist, Bloomberg, you name it. Um, or it could just be there are you you sense and you pick up on euphoria in the markets anyway just when you go on to x yeah. formerly twitter or whatever you can see from all the analysts posting yeah. you know when you're getting to a period a, a point in time where there might be extremes in sentiment unfortunately there aren't, there aren't obviously extremes all of the time but you know a couple of times a year or so there will be and it's really Correct. useful stuff so and then, yes, uh, as far as the fundamentals are concerned, on a day-to-day -day basis, then of course have to be aware of what what news releases are coming out. And you know, we got uh, uh, the Federal Reserve this week, the week that we're recording. Got We've got non-farm payrolls this week. All that stuff's important. Not necessarily that I'm executing all of the time on the back of that, but it's still important to my positions and to my decision making over the coming weeks ahead. Do you think, like uh, you've mentioned the central banks at the moment and the meetings, do you think that like previously, if we look back 2008, 2010, mm -hmm. the central banks and the monetary policies and all these, uh, actually, this, the policies they were making in case of tightening or easing, they were the one leading the markets. At the moment, you think that, like we have hear a lot about data dependent, data dependent, we're waiting for the numbers. Uh, what will the PCE or the CPI be? So if, like, do you think the markets are leading at the moment, not they, the central banks? They're trying to, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> the markets have been trying to price in the first Fed Correct. cut coming yeah. in for March. It's not going to happen, as no. we know. And we can already see that, that pricing coming down, that probability coming down in Fed futures pri uh, fund pricing. But that's just what the market is trying to almost bully the Fed into, into moving. And, and so the market's having to backtrack a little bit. And that's why we've seen a lot of uh, pushback from quite a few Fed officials saying, hold on a second, we're not ready to necessarily start cutting as soon as you think that we're going to cut. And, and I think the Fed are petrified of cutting too soon anyway, from going back to the 1980s when they cut too soon and then inflation came back and, and then it became uh, you know, uh, not, a good, not a good time. Of so course. So I think they want to have that, 
that element of credibility, and that's why they keep pushing back against the market. But they're going to cut this year, unless something happens to inflation materially. Sure. We'll talk about that. But um, it's you know they're they're forecasting in their dot plot they're going to cut this year, yeah. and it's likely. Well, I don't know if the Fed will, the Fed won't lead it, but when you look at the Fed versus the ECB, it might be ECB cutting first. But anyway, it's another argument itself. Yeah, but, because like, do you think because of the bad economic situation, the Europe eurozone actually is passing through you think they should be cutting first i think they'll be around the same sort of time but uh but absolutely their their numbers keep on coming out not <laughs> not not yeah, too great they're they? slow down actually it's yeah. much worse in yeah the eurozone, yeah and they just seem to can't get off off their knees we just keep on seeing data coming out of the big two you know france and germany and it, you know their pmi is not coming out well and um and general data releases as far as the german business environment is concerned it's not it's not great so mm. we've got pmi sitting at what 42 43 in manufacturing and services and then you've got the us pmis which are hovering around growth you know Correct. back into yeah, growth yeah. territory or well, services are anyway so um we we are looking at two economies whereby you've got one which is just far far stronger than the other so now the, the irony is when it comes to fundamentals is the well what we we've seen the euro just had quite a big rally in in face in the face of that mm -hmm. um just off of the october lows from um from late last year so You have to take into consideration the fundamentals, but timing is everything, as we know in the market. Correct. Because you could, if you just traded, I think solely on fundamentals. If you if you've got deep pockets to be able to sit back on a position, that's fine for a year or two. Then they'll normally play themselves out. But as a trader, and you're holding positions for maybe a few months, you know, then timing is important. I do think it will be interesting. Uh, interesting for the currencies actually, because like most of the traders, like beginners, let's say, yeah, they think that the engine of the, or the catalyst of the currencies is usually the dollar index. If it's stronger or weaker, then we can predict the direction of the currency. However, nowadays, because like as you mentioned, the ECB might cut before the Fed or Canada, for example, they raised rates first. Mm. And they can be the first to cut rates, actually. Yes, yeah. So basically, and we know that when the, the central bank cut rates, actually the currency will be weaker. So do you think that we might see the euro dollar, for example, um, maybe going lower and the pound still going higher? And we can see this negative correlations between the currencies this year. What, against the dollar? Yeah. Um, I think that usually, as you know, usually they, they move in tandem with each other. Um, and there's just degrees of outperformance or underperformance. Mm. I wouldn't expect to see the euro back down at, let's say, parity against the dollar. Mm. And the UK economy is outperforming uh, the, the Europe as well. But And then seeing the pound holding up against the dollar, I, I wouldn't really expect that. Um, it's not to say that these things couldn't happen, but um, for me, if I'm looking at the likes of the pound dollar, the euro dollar, they tend to move in, in tandem to a degree. I mean, oh, if you take right now, we're recording this in, actually, where are we, January, late January, and the pound is actually holding up against the dollar in a trading range, just consolidating, whereas the euro's been pulling back a little bit. So we see relative um, underperformance there um, right now against the dollar, but um, I think if the euro started going rolling over, then it's highly likely the pound will be as well. But that's just my hmm. my view. I, I don't know actually if you followed up with the latest Japanese central bank decisions. Yeah. But they're going to raise rates. Yeah. Do you think the opportunity is there this year? Like the the only bank that's going to raise rates yeah. is Japan. If and <laughs> the Fed, I like 25 years of the deflationary mindset. Yeah. It's very hard for them to mm. step out and raise rates. Like th they are not used to that. No. But if they did, imagine dollar yen would be a great sell opportunity. Absolutely. Apart from those swaps. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, absolutely. The I mean they we just had the Bank of Japan last week and Oeda was saying last week, uh, look, they're looking out to those wage negotiate those rounds of wage negotiations coming up in March and April. So we are looking at the potential, and they certainly alluded last week that They could be having that that first change of policy at the April meeting, but what 
the Bank of Japan have history with saying one thing and then doing another. <laughs> really? And that window of opportunity for them to raise rates could come, you know, could narrow um, if the economy starts to, you know, um, underperform again. So I, I think they, I'd love to see them raise rates mm. um, for obvious reasons, like you've just said. I think it'd be a great trade. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why we saw uh, that strength come into the uh, dollar yen, sorry, weakness, uh, the yen strengthen against the dollar just a few months ago. Um, and obviously it steadied itself over this past month, but um, it would be a very strong sell off if it happens, yeah. Mm. Um, but you've got to hold on for those and pay those swaps. <laughs> yeah, because exactly. they are. They, no, but then again, the swaps won't be quite as bad if they're raising their rates anyway. Maybe I the interest think rate about differentials auctions, will come back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, buy some put options maybe. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? Like when you when you operate the chart and you want to analyze an entry point, like we we do know that mm. looking at the fundamentals, hearing the news, you kind of uh, gather some information about the direction you're going to take. However, like the entry points and the exit points, you mm. can you need to look at the chart. Yeah, you need to use some technicals, some indicators. Yep. What is the first indicator that comes on your mind and? You put on the chart. I'm old school, and so I like um, as far as the charts. I start off with them naked, naked charts, nothing else on, and I'll look for anywhere I can put a trend line or a channel, mm -hmm. um, and and just horizontal support levels, historical levels, and resistance, and that will form the basis of just having some horizontal levels on my chart and a trend line or two if they're if they're there. Beyond that. I love moving averages. Not because, you know, people say, oh God, moving averages are <laughs> lagging. Though they are if you use moving average crossovers. Yeah, correct. But I use moving averages as support and as resistance themselves, like a, like a moving trend line. Lovely. So, yeah. So, and price likes to move away from moving averages, like it will do a trend line or a support level, and it will naturally gravitate back as well. So there's correct. this ebb and flow of price moving away and then mean reverting back. So they work like a magnet, you mean? Absolutely. It's a, like a pivotal number. Yeah. Whenever the price goes like beyond this area, it should retrace back. Yes. So And so you get used to, as a trader, seeing that that movement and it's a very graceful movement as price moves away from the moving average within a trend and then at certain points um, it'll retrace back to them as well so I use a multiple of moving averages short term up to sort of you know 50 period mm -hmm. and 200 periods you know the usual um, sort of medium term moving averages as well so they'll be on my chart, chart the only other thing I have on my chart is a MACD so just for momentum and and I look I use uh, an MACD for at times when there are divergences in a market as well. So if a market's come into a you know, key support zone, it's, I, it's quite uncanny the amount of times mm. when price will come into a key support or key resistance level, and there'll be some divergence there in momentum. And mm -hmm. if I see a, a momentum divergence, then that would be the sort of thing that I'd look to get in on as well. Very simple yet very effective, I think. Like, uh, yeah. no need to, to put many indicators on the chart. No. I usually, if you look at, for example, the Ishimoku, oh, yeah. the Japan, like it's made up of moving averages actually. Yeah. Like many yeah. indicators contains moving averages mm -hmm. inside of it, like even the Bollinger Bands. Mm -hmm. So um, I do work uh, Fibonacci. I love Fibonacci a lot. Okay. And yeah. I work Elliott Waves. It's uh, been like more than 11 years. Yeah. I count waves. And yeah, <laughs> it's a little bit. Uh, not is this like a therapy for you then? Is it <laughs> correct? Like, but but like it's it's whenever you 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 ride the wave, yeah. and I like to actually be on the impulsive waves. Yeah, and not trade the corrective ones. Yeah. So this is um, yeah. how I trade, but. Um, well, there's an old there's an old adage, you know, you you fade the short term trend in in favour of the la the larger term. Correct. So, if, if from an Elliott wave perspective, you wouldn't trade a, a wave two pullback because but you'd be Never. waiting for that Correct. wave three. Correct. You wouldn't wait. So, you, if anything, you'd be fading the the wave two in yeah. order to get long in anticipation of the wave three. Or, yeah. But basically, you mentioned something about the charts, like the top-down analysis you mean like mm -hmm. you, you start analyzing the monthly weekly daily yeah. and then yep. like, even though i don't want to trade uh, 
the, I, I don't I don't want to take the trade for several weeks. It might be just for maybe a day or half mm-hmm. a day, but I still look at the bigger charts. Yeah, yeah. You agree with that? Yeah, like yeah, even if you're scalping, you just need to know the, the bigger direction. Yeah, absolutely. Even if you're scalping the market, you still need to have an anchor chart. Mm. So you still probably need to see realistically what an hourly, what a four hour chart is, or, or even a daily, even if you're an intraday scalper, just to give you the levels. Because otherwise you're just blinkered. You don't see all of the levels if you're just looking at a one minute chart. So, mm. all right, everyone's got their own style, but just in my, that's just a personal experience thing that I would say, yeah, you still want to see what's going on in the higher time frames and what what that trend is that you're actually getting involved in. Because you must be, if you're buying, you're either with it or you're against it. Mm-hmm. So you need to see if you're actually trading against key levels or not. I want to, to know more about you and risk management is something you hear a lot. Mm. For me, I'm uh, an aggressive trader. Right. And whenever I have something in mind I want to buy or a gift for my wife, <laughs> I have this, you know, like, I need to make this amount. Okay. Yeah. So I'm very aggressive. What right. about you? What kind of trader you are? Like, do you abide by the rules, one person, two person? I'm, because I'm, um, because I'm a, a money manager over there in UK as well, so I'm FCA regulated mm-hmm. in, in London, I have to, you know, you have to be very strict with what I do because I'm managing clients' money. You know, I obviously have to trade my own accounts as mm-hmm. well, but even with those now, what I've found is as I've got older, I've, I've become less aggressive. So mm-hmm. I was more aggressive when I was in my 30s than I am now at 51. So, and I think that's a natural if. Uh, evolving thing as a trader that quite often you can be more aggressive when you're younger and then gradually uh, over years you become less um, aggressive so no I'm I'm I would say I'm I'm not as aggressive I'm naturally aggressive mm. but it's been toned down over the years now so um, and I never go into the market to try and buy myself my wife a gift I never, <laughs> never do that I never even tell her I don't even tell her how much money I make she does not know and if I, I wouldn't even tell I might say to her oh I'll, I've had a good year or whatever but if, if I told her she'll be like right where this should we go free money <laughs> yeah <laughs> no let's not do that that's my pension money no <laughs> so um I think I mean, one, one thing on yeah. that, and I think this is really important, especially for newer traders, uh, any of your listeners who are newer to trading, uh, one thing I feel quite strongly on is uh, goal setting and people having goals, but not in the way that most people do it. So most people will have a financial goal. So they'll say, okay, I've got X amount in my in my trading account and I want to make X amount. If more, pe- more traders could have a mindset more like professional sports people, mm-hmm. then I would be happier. And what I mean by that is if you set out to make 5% a month or whatever the, the, the goal is, you're setting yourself up for disappointment if you don't achieve that goal. Correct. And that, that uh, brings about a whole range of uh, emotions, frustration, frustration yeah. all of that. Yeah. And that is then carried on into your future trading. So really for traders, the, the best goal that you can have is to be the best trader you can be. Mm-hmm. The money will take care of itself. So if your sole focus is on executing the best way you can, following your trading plan, all of that stuff and all of your energy is, is um, put into being the best trader you can be, forget the goal, forget the monetary goal. They will take care of themselves. But if you're only looking at the money, then how can you be focused on being the best trader you can be? Mm-hmm. And that can, I, I find that a lot of new traders go down that, and, and I feel that's a bit of a trap. And so, when I trade, I put a take profit in my mind. I have these yep. levels, I'm looking forward for the price to reach. I've never waited for take profits. Never. I had the patience. Mm. Like, what would you recommend? You oh what you don't have the patience. I don't have the patience to wait for my TPs. T- right. Yeah, I use um, a lot of self-talk with traders. So I think traders need to um, use a lot of language and talk out loud to themselves. So one way to help a trader stay stay for that take profit is to say, 
I can't afford to bank this profit right now. So let's say your take profit might have been a, a one to three risk reward. Mm -hmm. Let's just go with that. And then you've got traders, and we know this because brokers have this data, what traders do, and they'll come out at uh, one, to a, one to a half. <laughs> and so yeah. um, they don't even come out at one to one risk reward, exactly. they're coming out less. So that their risk to reward ratio is all inverted. 100%. And so the best way that they can help with that is to say, I, uh, it'd be lovely to have this money right now, but if I just keep on taking trades like this and taking this money, that in the long run, I'm not holding on my trades for long enough. So if I take 100 trades, I'm going to end up potentially losing money here. So I can't afford to bank mm -hmm. this right now. So using that sort of language can really help a, a newer trader to hold on to their to their profits, to whatever their target is. Because if they start jumping out early, then um, they're more likely to be um, having inverted risk rewards mm -hmm. and, and more likely, I'm not saying you can't be profitable with an inverted risk reward, but it's more likely that you won't to end up, yeah. yeah. What, are, what are your thoughts about, uh, I, I love to buy bottoms and sell tops. Okay. And I thought you told me you just like wave twos and wave three, uh, wave fours. Yeah, <laughs> that's why, like I, I, I always wait for wave two to be traced and yeah. try to buy the bottom. Oh, okay, yeah, like, within I, a trend. Exactly. Yes. But I, like when the price start moving towards the direction I'm assuming, I don't like to, to jump in, in the middle of the wave. Okay. So do you, and we, we do know that selling tops and buying bottoms is not always there in the market. You can't always do it. No. You know, like, what are your thoughts about that? Like, if you've seen uh, a stock market at the moment, it's already like in the hype, it's in the bull market. Yeah. Would you still buy the highs? Uh, yes, I was buying the S&P last year and, you know, amongst all that pessimism, but we, the first six months of last year, I was very pessimistic towards the stock market. So that was a good sign for me. You know, it's, it, the, the, the market was, as they, the old expression, riding that wall of worry, whereas mm -hmm. most investors didn't believe that it could keep on going higher. Yeah. Surely we're going to go into a recession because of all these interest rate rises. You know, it was that type of... Uh, mindset um, from a sentiment perspective but even now we're coming into the new year and actually as of the beginning of January I'm still bullish and maybe we'll talk about this mm. um, for the year overall look there's going to be pullbacks and uh, what you know, we've just had this incredible rally off the October and, uh, and November and December you know it's just been an amazing two three month run the market was pricing the cut the rate cuts that's yeah. going to happen yeah this is one of the catalysts that helped the stock market yeah yeah and of course the earnings and the tech the companies yeah. and all these like nvidia yeah. the but the companies. probabilities still are on the market side for this year so we've come into this year on the back of the s p did 24 percent gain last year even on the back of that, there's an 83% probability that we will end up with a positive return for the S&P again this year. It won't be 20, 20 odd percent, but the, the, the probabilities go with that. Now, there is a spanner in the works, it's called Donald Trump, but <laughs> we, the, the probabilities historically favor the, the stock markets and going into a presidential election year. So the probabilities actually do favor um, an up year for stocks. Having said that, if you're a short-term trader, then anything can happen in the near term. You know, NASDAQ and the S&P have just broken out to, well, S&P's just broken out to new highs. NASDAQ did it earlier. But of course, I think the market, a lot of participants, we're all looking for when's this next pullback coming. And I think that's always a dangerous sign because when we're all looking for it, it doesn't happen. Exactly. And that's what's yeah, happened great. in January. They've just carried on going higher. So. I don't want to try and predict when when that happens, but there will definitely be pullbacks because that's just the natural ebb and flow of things. But now with the worldwide economic slowdown happening and mm -hmm. what's happening like in the Red Sea actually will boost the inflation again. It will take higher, definitely, because like they're paying more on the yeah. shipments and everything. And the, the countries that has the more effect actually from this what's happening in the Red Sea is Europe and China because China takes gas liquid gas from Qatar through the Red Sea right so basically and China now with the what's happening with the real estate yeah. stuff and the 
you know, like, I think the economy might face, like, a really slow down, and it might spill over. We know that China always spill over what's happening in its economy to the other economies. So do you, don't you think, like, the slowdown would affect the stock market this year? Could well do. I'm just... It's, there was plenty of arguments to suggest last year that the stock market should go down, and it didn't. So I'm just going with the probabilities. So some other things that I follow as well, there's some big, um, and they don't actually happen that often, but we had uh, what we call a breadth thrust. We had two big breadth thrusts in the US markets last year. It's just uncanny that when you get these, there's not been a single instance in history that when these breadth thrusts have kicked in, like we had two in, in 2023, prior to that, they were years before. But there's not been a single instance in history where the f following a breadth thrust, uh, 12 months later, the market hasn't been higher. Mm -hmm. And the last breadth thrust was in November of last year. Look, I know that there's a, a lot of things going on. There's always a lot of things going on. You're absolutely right about the situation in the Red Sea um, being inflationary. We've got China just cutting interest rates at the moment to try and stimulate their economy. We've got what is probably going to be one of the ugliest US election campaigns coming up. <laughs> and so there's a lot of, of potentials. And yes, the stock market may well end up down. Yeah. But I'm just saying that probability favours it being positive for this year. But like, we won't know until December. As a fund manager, when you always look to... You're, you're always looking for investments, actually, and you want the best return. So when you look at the interest rates, Definitely, there will be a cut this year from 5.5 yeah. lower. However, if you look at the dot plot, you're seeing that the cuts might be somewhere around three cuts. Let's say four. Yeah. Let's be optimistic. Let's be, yeah, optimistic. And let's say four, 100, 150 basis points. Uh -huh. From 5.5 to 4%. Yeah. 4% is still high. Yeah. It's still high. And many mm. managers, fund managers, they think that, and you can see the bond market, it's recovering actually at the moment. Because, yeah. like, yeah. yeah. Like it's it's giving you a good return. Yeah. So why choose the stock market? Like it, this was the main question actually October November last year. Like the stock market the stock market is going up. Okay, but there's other options. Absolutely, you can get five percent guaranteed on exactly. your money. So yeah, why absolutely. go for the stocks? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, I, look, I totally get that, and that is a great argument. And I think I think plenty of people have started dipping their toe in the water. But it's quite amazing how many people weren't when we were sitting up when bond yields, ten-year yields, were sitting higher. How many people still weren't doing it? But I'm actually a, a bond bull over so. In line with what you're saying, with interest rates coming down, I think one thing when it comes to interest rates, especially in the US, and this is a US thing, because that's where I do most of my trading if I'm mm. trading the S&P or whatever, or the NASDAQ, is that over there, when you look at interest rates, the impact that interest rates have on, on property owners is different to the impact it would have in the UK, where I'm from, for example. So most um, people who have mortgages, they're 30-year fixed terms. So... Once you've taken your mortgage out, it's fixed for the next 30 years. So in spite of all these higher interest rates in the last 18 months, two years, it's, not, it's only affecting new borrowers. It's not affecting people who are already in the market, who are already on the property ladder, because they've got these long-term fixed mortgages. In the UK, people have to refix every two, three years, or sometimes five years, depending on what they've done. So that is an impact, uh, mm -hmm. like for in the UK and probably Europe as well. But the US, it's a, it's a weird one that you've got a lot of homeowners who have not been impacted. And that's why we've seen consumption still actually outperforming in spite of those higher interest rates, because the consumer is saying, well, I've not moved house. I don't, you know, I've still got this, this cash here because my my borrowing costs have not gone up. Maybe they have on their cars, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so, and that's where we've got to at the moment. Now, obviously the Fed wants the consumer to rein it in. They want to engineer a slowing of that economy. Mm -hmm. And and if that can start to come in a bit more, which we, we keep on thinking it's coming in, we and we see some data points coming in a bit more negative, as we've seen. Um, but then we go and see like jobs, which just keep on the doing so well. The strongest in 50 years. 
the strongest. The job market yeah. now in the US it's the strongest since 50 yeah. years. Yeah. And so it's crazy. Yeah. And so they would rather see a higher uh, unemployment rate uh, come tick through. You know, we're going to see non-farm payrolls coming up at the end of this week that we're recording this and, and I, I wouldn't do, want to bet against it. Exactly. And I do believe that the verbal intervention from the Fed last year was phenomenal. Like he was already giving the market some room about unemployment. Like we can go to 4.5%. Yeah, it was still 3.8, 3.7. You mm-hmm. know, like he he's, I I think he did a good job. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Well, he's doing a damn sight better job than Christine Lagarde, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Because the thing is with the, with the ECB uh, over in Europe, they they conflict each other a lot. So yeah. she'll say one thing, and then the, then the all right. And I know it's a bit it's, it's similar in a way that within the Fed, obviously the the Fed members you can have more hawk, you can have hawks and doves, mm-hmm. but the ECB. Be the messaging always seems wrong and not I think convincing. there's many many things wrong that's happening, but definitely like they know better. Like what about the emergency program, the PEPP and the APP, which is like yeah. actually some kind of you're you're easing the policies because you're spending some money and yeah. you know, and at the same time raising rates, mm. tightening the policy. So it's contradicting actually. Mm. And I do think like I've been researching uh, there is a formula called Taylor Taylor's formula, Taylor Swift formula, and uh, it actually it's a formula that calculates where the interest rate should be, and this formula have been like working for the past 60 years actually. Oh, so it's not based on Taylor Swift the singer then? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a math- he's yeah. a math- mathematician. Yeah. So basically, the, the, this formula. Um, has been saying that the interest rates in the EU should have been 6.75 instead of 4.5. Wow. So, wow. Yeah, like if you think about it, like the US raised until 5.5, like why the ECB stopped at 4.5%. Mm-hmm. It should it should have been much more higher to, you know, I think they were very to scared. Fight the, yeah, I do it's think a very so. Very fragile economy. Exactly. Yeah. Like, like it's it's understandable because like when you think when you look at Germany and these economy like developed somehow economies and mm-hmm. then you have Portugal you have Spain you have Italy mm-hmm. you have these underdeveloped economies yeah so yeah it should have been th- this way actually because like there's there should be a balance between these countries yeah it, and, that, and and that's a problem that the Europe has is you've got stronger economies big economy like yeah. Germany and then you've got far weaker economies as well and then but then a, a blanket approach to interest rates mm-hmm. across all economies and some would probably be able to handle it and at higher rates more than others and I don't know so it's uh, yeah I, I don't relish uh, how the was the life job. how was the life in UK with a double digit inflation um, like from a household perspective you know like yeah, I, I don't pay the bills, but uh, <laughs> my wife does. But um, yes, um, like you felt it was uh, like the inflation was. Uh, the only the... point with the, she would she manages the house, so on a personal level, was I noticing it? No, I noticed that fuel prices were quite mm-hmm. high, obviously, um, but also uh, heating. That was the big one mm-hmm. um, that she was saying. Wow, you know, heating bill is now you know three times or whatever it was for three or four times what it used to be I'm like, wow so yeah i did notice things like that i didn't overly notice fuel, uh, food inflation although it was absolutely crazy there. yeah and so um and it's only when someone actually says it you know oh do you know how much a pint of milk is now and like, oh wow that really is it's gone up a lot so so yeah she would notice it more than i do because i don't you know, I, I just float around and don't know what's going on half the time. So, um, you know, that's not a good thing. But anyway, it's just the way our life is. Charlie, it was uh, an awesome talk. Thank you for your time. Oh, well, thanks Pleasure for coming in. Here. Wow, that's gone over, you know, so quick. So, yeah, yeah thanks for uh, having me in and uh, very much uh, enjoyed to have a little chat on. Yeah, thank you so much. Trying for to put the world to the right. information. Thank you so much.